There was a time when racing in F1 meant dying in a terrible accident. Before all the TV shows, the multi-million dollar sponsorships, the super high-tech cars, and the crazy drama, Formula One was one of the world's most dangerous and exciting sports. Back in 1894, we saw the first ever motor race zooming from Paris to a nearby city. But no one could have predicted that 56 years later, they'd make an entire championship out of it. This is the truth behind the origins of Formula One. So way back in the 1920s and 1930s, European Grand Prix championships were already revving up the excitement. But it wasn't until 1946 that things kicked into high gear. That year, the Federation International de la Automobile, or the FIA, stepped in and set some standard rules for the sport. And boom, in 1950, we had the first ever World Championship of Drivers, officially marking the start of modern Formula One. In 1950, Formula One made its grand debut at Silverstone, England. Back then, there were about 20 races held across Europe from spring to fall. And let me tell you, things got heated on the track. Italian cars, especially Alfa Romeo, were ruling the scene. With legendary drivers like Rudolf Caracciola and Tazio Nuvolari making their mark. But it wasn't just about the Italians. We saw rising stars like Alberto Ascari and Juan Manuel Fangio tearing up the track, ready to write their chapters in Formula One history. Cars roared around the track, designed purely for speed with front engines and drum brakes. But there was no safety net, no medical backup, no seat belts, nada. It was the wild west of racing. Back in the 50s, safety wasn't a thing. It was after World War II and people accepted that racing was dangerous. Being a pro racer? Well, it was like playing Russian roulette. Even seat belts didn't become mandatory until 1972. In 1960, things got deadly. Two drivers lost their lives during the Belgian Grand Prix and two more were seriously injured. It was heartbreaking. Chris Bristow's Cooper went out of control and didn't make it. Then there was Alan Stacy, who tragically died after a bird flew into his face at top speed. Can you believe they didn't even have full visor helmets back then? But there was more to this decade than just tragedy. For one, the British were continuing their spree of dominating, except this time it was in the Formula One world instead of the real one. They shook up the game with mid-engine cars, giving Italian teams a run for their money. Thanks to this, we saw five new British world champions emerge. And Formula One, it was spreading its wings. With new races popping up in Canada, the USA, Mexico, and South Africa. But it wasn't just about winning races. Teams like McLaren and Williams were setting up shop on their own. And by this point, Formula One teams needed cash more than ever to stay in the game. So it was the 70s. And let's just say things were getting crazily expensive with all those crashes, rule changes, and life insurance headaches. But you know what they say, where there's a will, there's a way. Teams figured out a clever workaround, slapping ads on their cars during races for some sweet cash. They'd advertise anything and everything, from condoms to cigarettes to rock bands. And guess what? Sponsorships are still king today. Now, let's talk about legends. We had two big shots back then, Nicky Lotta and James Hunt. Lotta was all about that grind. The dude was about as professional as you can get. And then there was Hunt, living it up with his smokes, bubbly, and models. Probably the biggest highlight from that era? Well, that'd be the 1976 season, of course. Oh, that was a thriller. Lotta and Ferrari competed with Hunt and McLaren, making it the closest title fight yet. Even with Lotta's near-death experience, the championship came down to the wire at the Japanese Grand Prix. And guess what? Hunt got his first and only title in those intense final laps. 
Heading into the early 80s, and well, now was a bad time to be a constructor. With races scattered across five continents, it was tough for private teams to keep up. Each track calls the shots on ads and prize money, while FIA calls the shots on rules and regulations. But then, Bernie Ecclestone stepped in, forming the Formula One Constructors Association to level the playing field. Then came the ground effect era, a wild ride of new tech like sideboards and Nelson Paquet winning the championship. And hey, this was when we got some rookies making waves too, like Elaine Prost and Ayrton Senna, rising stars in the 80s. Prost was on fire, grabbing titles left and right with McLaren, while Senna's driving style was pure magic, even if his personal life was a bit dicey. Then in 92, Williams rolled out active suspension and dominated, thanks to Nigel Mansell and Prost. And then 94 rolls in, bringing Senna to Williams, Schumacher to Benetton, and the promise of an electrifying season ahead. But then it all came crashing down. That's because the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix goes down in history as one of Formula One's darkest weekends. It started with Roland Ratzenberger's fatal crash during qualifying, followed by Ayrton Senna's tragic accident during the race itself. Senna's car failed, sending him into a fatal collision at 192 miles per hour. This shook the FIA awake, reminding them that Formula One cars, despite technological advances, weren't as safe as they thought. The aftermath saw Williams under scrutiny for a possible mechanical failure. But amidst the tragedy, the championship battle raged on between Michael Schumacher and Damon Hill, neck and neck the whole season. They arrived at the final race in Australia, separated by a single point. But controversy struck again when Michael and Hill collided, handing Schumacher his first world title. Despite the uproar, no action was taken against Michael, but he learned his lesson. Well, until he repeated a similar stunt three years later. The 1997 championship saw Hill disqualified and Schumacher heavily criticized by the media. And with that, welcome to the next century of F1 racing. At this point, McLaren and Mika Hakkinen were dominating the world championship, while Schumacher was chasing his first title for Ferrari. The roar of V10 engines now fills the air, adding a new soundtrack to the races. For over 40 years, no driver had more than two titles in a row, but Ferrari and Michael were set to rewrite history with their five consecutive championships. Their dominance was so complete that in 2002, Ferrari ended the season with as many points as all other teams combined. Meanwhile, Renault found a rising star in Fernando Alonso a young Spaniard whose daring moves seemed to go against physics. He was determined to break Ferrari's streak and become the youngest double world champion. McLaren, eager to reclaim glory, shook things up in 2007 with an all-new lineup featuring Alonso and a rookie. Their plan? Total domination. But things didn't go as planned. Turns out they accidentally signed Lewis Hamilton, who raced like a seasoned pro right out of the gate. This sparked a heap of controversies, like Spygate, where McLaren got slapped with a 100 million pound fine for sneaky Ferrari document dealings. And guess who won the season? Yep, it was Ferrari, leaving Hamilton in the dust. Although he did pull off a thrilling last minute overtake the next year. Then in 2009, the FIA shook up the sport with some new regulations. Braun GP seized the opportunity, building a monster car that Jensen Button skillfully piloted to victory before the big budget teams caught up. Then enters Sebastian Vettel, Red Bull's golden boy of the early 2010s. Powered up by Red Bull, he soared to four consecutive world titles, dominating the field like a champ. But as the turbo hybrid era dawned, a new contender emerged after 55 years away from the sport. Yep, it was Mercedes. They roared back onto the scene with a beast of a car, boasting top-notch aerodynamics and a powerhouse engine that left rivals out of luck for years. 
but with success came drama as Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg duked it out, resulting in a fierce rivalry called the Silver War. These two titans traded championships and dominated the grid for three intense years until Rosberg hung up his helmet in 2016. But the action didn't stop there. Hamilton went on to a championship spree, grabbing four more titles, while Mercedes continued their reign until the end of the turbo hybrid era. Then came 2021 and Max Verstappen and Hamilton went toe to toe in an intense battle that would go down in history. They were neck and neck all season long with Verstappen winning some, Hamilton winning others, and some days they were so close they could practically touch each other. The showdown culminated in the 2021 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix with Verstappen grabbing victory from the pole position, getting his first world title, and kicking off a series of successive victories that would make him the unforgettable driver we know today. F1 hit reset for the next season, with new regulations and Verstappen again breaking records left and right, winning an impressive 15 races in a single season, and eventually winning his second championship, followed by his third in 2023. And well, that's about it. Anyways, if you want to check out some more content on F1 racing and its history, make sure to click on this next video.